All right, hello everyone, and welcome to our clean water webinar series. We're really able to continue offering these webinars to our monitors, volunteers, friends, and the clean water community as a chance to learn about clean water issues and stay connected. I'm Rebecca Shore, the Mid-Atlantic Save Our Streams Coordinator for the Isaac Walton League of America. Before I turn things over to our presenters today, I have a few quick housekeeping items about this GoToWebinar platform. First of all, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Isaac Walton League YouTube channel soon. Keep an eye on our website at IWLA.org for information about the recording and our upcoming September webinar. Second, if you have a question during the presentation, you can type it and send it in the GoToWebinar chat box. Please note that you won't be able to see each other's questions or chats, um, but we will be able to see your questions and comments as you send them in. We're going to have time for question and answer at the end of the presentation, and during the interactive portion of Stacy's presentation, we'll be reading aloud your responses to some of her questions. So please don't hesitate to send in questions and comments throughout the webinar, and we'll be sure to answer all of your questions at the end. The webinar should run for about an hour, including time for Q&A, uh, but our speakers have said they can stay on for a few extra minutes if need be. So again, don't hesitate to send in those questions. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Messiah Maeda, Stacy Lucas, and Raina S. from the Anacostia Watershed Society to discuss their work with the Trash Trap Program, their community engagement events, and their community cleanup events throughout the Anacostia Watershed. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Raina to introduce us to their society. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Raina Askew, um, I am the Manager of Community-Based Restoration at the Anacostia Watershed Society. Um, I am super excited to be here with you all today and with my colleagues Stacey Lucas and Masaya Maeda, um, who are going to be telling us more about um, our trash issues in the river, the work that we're doing around that, and how we're engaging the community, and how you all can engage your communities about this. Um, before we jump into that, I'm just gonna give you guys a little bit of background about who we are as Anahasia Watershed Society and, um, and a little bit of the work that we do, just so we can all start on the same page. All right, so um, the Anacostia Watershed Society, our mission is to restore and protect the Anacostia River and its watershed communities. We have a vision of having a swimmable and fishable Anacostia River uh, for the health and enjoyment of all of our community members. Our goal is to have a swimmable and fishable Anacostia River by 2025. And the ways that we hope to do this are through stewardship, education, recreational events, and advocacy. So just a couple of pictures to get you guys familiar with the kind of work that we do. This is a picture of some of our volunteers working on a rain garden at UMD. This is a picture of one of our volunteers getting dirty in the wetlands, helping us to plant some native wetland plants. And a picture of some of our students participating in some of our school-based education programs. We run education programs both for youth and for adults. And a picture of us um, out on the river in some kayaks. We love to get people out on the river um, rowing, on kayaks, on canoes, on part of our pontoon boat tours as a way of building their relationship with the river and with the water. So just to make sure we're all starting on the same page, um, some of you may be asking, what is a watershed? A watershed is an area of land around a body of water that all drains into that body of water. So you can kind of think of it as a bowl and the sides or boundaries of your watershed, they're like the edge of the bowl and anything that water touches anywhere inside of it is gonna roll, roll, run down into the bottom of that bowl or your body of water, your lake, your stream, your river. So in this example, you can see that this yellow dotted line that's on the outside of these mountain peaks, that's the boundary of the watershed. So everything within those yellow boundaries is gonna flow down to that central river and then out into that bigger body of water at the bottom. Everything on the outside of those boundary lines where rain would fall, would fall into a different body of water. So it would be a different watershed. So when I talk about the Anacostia watershed, what exactly do I mean? I'm talking about 
our land that surrounds the Anacostia River. Our river um, begins at the meeting of, or the confluence of the Northwest and Northeast branches of the Anacostia River in Bladensburg, Maryland. This river runs for about eight miles until it opens into the mouth of um, our river at the, where it meets the Potomac River. Um, so the Anacostia River is a tributary of the Potomac River. So if you are in the Anacostia watershed, you are also at the same time, a part of the Potomac River watershed. And the even bigger regional boundary that we're all a part of is the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So when we're talking about the Anacostia watershed, we're talking about the Eastern half of DC, Prince George's County and Montgomery County. We're a tidal river. Um, and we're part of obviously the Chesapeake Bay watershed and we're an urban watershed. So there's some unique challenges that we face in the Anacostia watershed that are unique to us and other urban watersheds. So in this photo, you can see um, one of our maps that we use really often. So in this map, the pink boundary around the outside is the boundary of our watershed. So everyone living inside of this pink boundary lives in the Anacostia watershed um, and then over on the other side, they're part of other watersheds. So there's also, um, so, so folks in Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and then these parts of DC, any water that touches that land eventually ends up in the Anacostia River. Okay, we're gonna bring it all the way back to first or second grade. I know you guys have probably seen this photo before. This is the water cycle. So just as a quick refresher, water that falls on the ground, you know, it helps the trees and plants grow. Some of that water is going to infiltrate into the ground. It's going to recharge our groundwater, which is eventually going to get into our bodies of waters, our lakes, our rivers, our streams. Some of that water evaporates, creates more rain. You guys know how this goes. So what happens when we've got an urban area and instead of just a natural landscape? So part of what's interrupted here is that there's less infiltration of that water into the ground and we get more runoff meaning more water that just slides over the top of the ground instead of being absorbed into the groundwater. Why is this happening? It's because in our cities um, and, and you know, all of our developed areas, there's a lot more what we call impervious surfaces. So impervious or impermeable surfaces are things, their sidewalks, their asphalt on parking lots, their rooftops, their roads, the places where the water can't seep into the ground, where it's just going to flow over top of the ground and end up going into our system of storm drains or pipes that take that water away from the street, away from people's houses to water treatment plants and sometimes directly depositing into our rivers and streams. Um, if you can check this map again, just as a reminder, we're looking at the Chesapeake Bay, so that's the big area. And the Anacostia River watershed has a very high percentage of impervious surface compared to the rest of our watershed. So you can see this area around DC that is that has lots of red. So we have more impervious surface, more roads, more asphalt, more rooftops, less trees, less grass than other areas. And what happens when we've got more rooftops and more driveways and sidewalks is that we get more stormwater runoff pollution. And what that means is that anything that was on that land, remember we talked about that bowl where all the water runs to the center? Anything that's on that land, dog poop, fertilizer on your lawn, pesticides, chemicals, trash, anything that's on the ground, when it rains, that water is going to carry those items, microscopic or big, eventually into our waterways. It goes into our storm drains and it eventually ends up polluting our local waterways. So we have a lot of issues that this creates in our urban watershed that are unique to us. Um, so some of the issues that we're facing in the Anacostia watershed are nutrients. This is an issue that's probably um, less, and less um, strong or less prominent for us than it is for more farmland, more rural watersheds, but we do still have some nutrients coming from fertilizers and things that people are putting on their grass that are ending up in our water that's changing the ecology of our river. Also thermal, meaning that you know how a sidewalk gets super, super hot. 
on a, on a hot DC day or a hot day in the summer, um, when the rain hits that sidewalk, it picks up some of that heat. And as that water goes into our streams and rivers, it heats up the water that's in those bodies of water, also making things difficult for wildlife and things that are living in that water because of the dramatic temperature change. Toxics, we have some um, historical industrial areas around our river that did pollute the river uh, many years ago and some ongoing um, pollution. Sediment, so this meaning, remember we talked all the way back at the beginning about um, how we have less trees and more buildings in our watershed. So that means that there's less things to prevent erosion. And a lot more of that soil is eroding off of um, places and washing into our river. So that both creates cloudy water and it's making um, our water depths less. Sewage, which is another issue that we have, um, and we could have a much longer conversation about this if you're interested in learning more about what um, DC is doing about sewage, you can look up the Clean the Rivers Project. But as just a brief intro, um, we have in a large part of DC what's called a combined sewer overflow system, meaning that our water, our water that we flush down the toilets and down our drains mixes with the storm water in our storm drains. And in an, on a dry day, that will go to our water treatment facility before it's released. But if we get overwhelmed with water, say in a super flashy storm, like we get quite often now with climate change, that water, the way the system is designed is that it overflows into streams and rivers instead of backing up into people's houses and causing flooding. So this was built as an emergency overflow system um, many, many years ago, which now creates too much pollution and too much sewage ending up in our river causing issues with bacteria and others. And of course, trash. So this is the issue we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into today. Um, and this is the point at which I'm gonna turn it over to um, Messiah to tell us more about how we're tackling trash issues in our river. Thank you very much, Reina. Uh, <clears throat> And thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, our effort. I'm going to uh, present uh, trash monitoring with volunteers and uh, lessons learned from their effort. This map shows the uh, uh, Anacostia River watershed and small red circle uh, enclosed area is a natural watershed. This is about 0 0.7 square mile and uh, as a mouth of this natural watershed, uh, <clears throat> we installed a trash truck. And uh, this one, uh, I, I, I hope you can see my mouse, but this one shows the Anacostia River, and this one is a Potomac River, and this black lines uh, boundary of Washington, D.C. And this is a, a trash trap, a natural trash trap. This is a screen type trap. And uh, because this is a screen type trap, uh, this, this is a very unique one because this trap can capture both floatable trash and non-floatable trash. Floatable trash uh, means uh, trash floating on the water. And this uh, photo shows just after rainfall events. As you can see, many kinds of trash pieces are captured. Uh, organic, matters, or organic matter also is captured. So we remove the mixture of the trash and organic matter next to a trap. And later, we get volunteers' help to sort now 13 categories. Uh, we used to uh, have sorted out into 47 categories, but now uh, 13 categories. And we collect weight data, count data, and volume data. So this trap has been uh, providing quality data, high quality data. And at the end of the event, we uh, put uh, uh, trashes into larger three categories, and uh, we take a group photo, and the volunteers will help uh, spread out 
uh, their experience uh, using SNS. <clears throat> And here, uh, from here, uh, we are going to a little deeper about trash data. Uh, some people may have worried about data. Uh, we hear various kinds of data, uh, like uh, <clears throat> some some people may say number one trash is grocery plastic bags. Forty percent maybe a uh, 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 plastic bag, and some others say fifty percent maybe plastic bottles. And others say 20% uh, of trash is styrofoam. When we add up those numbers, it doesn't make a 100%. <laughs> it goes over 100%. That is because uh, the data is different. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, where uh, data is collected and uh, how data is collected. So uh, we did a various kind of surveys, so we can talk about a little bit <coughs> uh, uh, about the difference. Uh, we did a street uh, trash survey, and uh, the number one category was paper. About 37% of trash items found on streets were paper. And uh, <coughs> a question is, does this uh, data represent uh, water uh, uh, trash pollution in in a river. Uh, no, because papers on streets gets wet and becomes heavier, and most of them uh, do not come into a river. Even uh, when it comes into river, because it's a paper, it's disintegrate in the water, so we don't see so many paper trash uh, in our streams. <clears throat> so second one, stream survey. Uh, this is a survey to walk along a stream and count pieces of trash by category. And when we did this survey, number one trash category was grocery plastic bags. About 47% of trash was plastic bags. And same question, does this represent a trash pollution in a river? And no. <clears throat> because plastic bags can be easily snagged by vegetation. So grocery uh, plastic bags uh, are often captured by vegetation. Uh, all other trash, most of, most of the trash just flows through the stream. So the data from here uh, does not represent trash pollution in a larger river or, or Chesapeake Bay or ocean, <clears throat> and shoreline cleanup. Uh, the data is uh, often very surprising, but uh, uh, the data can explain trash pieces that deposited on the shore or other trash, especially non-floatable trash, want to be uh, deposited, won't deposited on the shore. So, so the data uh cannot be representative about uh trash pollution <clears throat> so uh, force one trash burn and any other device that collects floatable trash so this data is also very interesting but this one uh can explain only trash floating on the water so, uh, so fifth one screen type and uh, netting type trash drops when these are maintained very well, uh, these one can capture most type of trash. So this one can explain trash pollution very well. That's why we, when we talk about trash, we, uh, we usually use trash data from national trash drop because it's a screen type trash drop. If we don't use the right data, we might mislead uh, our advocates to advocate only some specific uh, trash pieces. So we need to use a representative data. So uh, we realized that uh, it's important to s s talk about floatable and non-floatable trash. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this, these pictures show the difference uh, between between two types of drop, screen type drop and boon type drop. 
uh, left one natural and terrestrial screen type captures most kinds of trash pieces. Even smaller one, smaller pieces are tangled with organic matter, so we capture a lot of small small pieces. And the uh, right one, boon type, this look very nice, but uh, uh, only floatable trash, mostly plastic bottles, can be captured. And another way to show the uh, difference, uh, others category, others category or uh, uh, almost equivalent to, to non-floatable trash. So natural trap can capture a lot of other trash, but liver terrace trap boon type can capture only small portion of uh, others category. And this is another presentation on uh, <clears throat> uh, volume characteristics of trash. Uh, liver uh, natural trash trap can capture 54% of others category, uh, almost non floatable, but the liver terrace trap can capture only 13 uh, others category of trash. And 80%, about 80% of trash is bottles and cans, uh, in this case, mostly plastic bottles. And this is a data from Nashiran trash trap. Uh, about 70% of trash pieces are non-floatable trash. So this means uh, liver trash trash trap can capture up to 30% of trash all 70% of trash pieces just flow through underneath the burn, and we are sending uh, trash pieces into downstream community. Uh, however, are we still like this boon because uh, this boon can capture uh, uh, ugliest trash on, in the river <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, beautification of a river is very important because uh, if the liver is beautiful, many people will love the liver and will come to the liver, enjoy the liver, and those people may find some trash underwater surface, and uh, some of them may decide to complain about it to elected officials or public officials. Those uh, activities will further improve the Anakasa liver or any other liver. So this is a number one and number two trash pieces trap uh, captured by national trash trap. Number one is food wrappers, uh, cheap, cheap bags, Dorito bags. Those are uh, actually number one categories category. And uh, miscellaneous plastic pieces. This is a number two category. And uh, this is a famous photo taken by Chris Jordan. Uh, albatross chick photo because a parent bird cannot tell fish or trash so they feed it anyway of course baby birds cannot digest it so even though their stomach is full uh, the baby birds start to death and please uh, take a close look into the uh, contents of the stomach here and this is similar to this one, miscellaneous plastic pieces. We have a, a mo lot more uh, uh, cellophane uh, because we de uh, this trash was taken upstream, but similar to this one. <clears throat> so this shows a producer vendor survey. We picked up 12 categories out of 47 categories because these categories were only these categories were trackable to uh, producer vendors and we found that at least 71 percent of trash was dominated by top 10 companies on average 91 percent of trash were dominated by top 10 companies so uh, where is corporate responsibility? 
So uh, when I talked about this one uh, 10 years ago, it was very difficult to get uh, attention because there was no uh, there was no practical solution uh, <coughs> uh, to this no floatable trash problem. It's very difficult to tackle with. But now uh, atmosphere are changing, <coughs> and Senator Udao and Representative Lowenthal actually introduced a, a bill. It's called a Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, and this has a very good potential to reduce non-floatable trash pieces uh, because uh, the act requires plastic producers to take responsibility for collecting and recycling materials. Uh, uh, so this law uh, act will require uh, manufacturers to design, manage, and finance programs to process any waste. So. So if they don't want to pay uh, for clean up, clean up efforts, they have to design the package well so that they don't produce so much trash. So other uh, other requirements are national uh, nationwide container deposit deposit system and ban certain pollutant products, carry out bag fee bag fee a new minimum recycled content requirement. This is also very important because uh, some of you may know a recycling program is not working, but this will create a market for recycled product material and protect existing state action moratorium on new plastic facilities until EPA uh, establishes a better regulation on plat or plastic producing facilities, this act suggests uh, or require that to stop making new plastic facilities. So Sierra Club has a nice uh, campaign. This campaign will help you find your elected officials and uh, uh, enables, enables us to send messages to push for uh, this act. So please, uh, use this campaign program. Thank you. This is the uh, end of my presentation. And I just sent a link to that um, to that campaign in the chat box. So feel free to use that link um, and let folks know that you care about this issue. And Stacey, you're still muted, just so you know. Thank you. Um, thank you, Masia, for your presentation. Very insightful. A lot of information to take in. A lot of call to action that we can all do. I hope everyone is doing well today. Um, thank you for joining us and welcome. My name is Stacey Lucas and I am the Community Engagement Coordinator at Anacostia Watershed Society. The purpose of this session today is to assist you in a better understanding your community, the people in your community, and how to inspire people to take action in your community. Some of the topics that will be discussed today will be, what is, your what is a community? who makes up a community? What are the 10 traits that make up a community? What inspires people in your community? How to inspire the people in your community to take action and be more hands-on? And how to maintain the relationships that you're building within the community? Now, I want you to start to think about some of these questions. And as we're moving along throughout this presentation, I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts. So please be prepared to share with us. So what is a community? Well, as we see here, we have a variety of things going on here. Um, I want you to start thinking about what you think is a community and what makes up your community. 
so what we have here is the Webster definition of what is a community. And as you see, number one, it says a group of people living in the same place or have particular characteristics in the community. And number two, a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. So who makes up a community? Very important question. In a community, we have a variety of things going on. A healthy community is made up of different backgrounds, nationalities, religion, or belief systems, and economic structures. So who are the people in our community? Well, women, men, children, mothers, fathers, grandparents, doctors, nurses, firefighters, EMTs, police officers, dentists, farmers, individuals, librarians, teachers, mail carriers, essential workers, and yes, even our lovely friendly pets. All of us make up a community. All of us make up a healthy community. What are the 10 traits that makes up a community? So some of the 10 traits that make up a community is basically working together towards a positive goal. You find that through uh, community monthly meetings and surveys um, that your residents and you should be coming up with a goal that everyone is agreeing on and should be done collectively. Number two, in your communities, you should be allowing for freedom of expression, creating a safe space for residents to share their view and in a positive and respectful manner, meaning not everyone's gonna always agree with each other. However, being respectful to each other, you will get a lot done. We wanna promote fairness in the community. We wanna ensure residents that your community is not only welcomes, but also practices diversity and gives a voice to the minority population within the community. You wanna be able to set clear policies and obligations so that means consider not setting rules for your community, but instead work to encourage residents to fulfill their obligations as a resident living within the community. For example, attending more community meetings, uh, maybe keeping all your dogs on leashes, cleaning up poop when they're doing out there, and um, just making sure that people are able to come up with realistic goals for policies and obligations, and this can be part of your community's goal. You want to be able to maintain sensitivity towards community members, making sure that residents' concerns and questions are answered in a timely fashion. You want to be able to celebrate community heritage, promoting your community's culture, promote, promoting heritage, promoting history. Um, you can do things like send out monthly annual newsletters, talking about accomplishes, who some of the longest residents you have living in the community, celebrating birthdays of community, anything that you can think of that's gonna celebrate the community and bring people together. Promote interaction among community members. You wanna provide opportunities for residents to interact with each other. This promote connections and keeps residents motivated to fulfill obligations in the community. You wanna also elect leaders that stand behind community values. During your discussions, you should be bringing up things that are important. Again, going back to respecting everyone is gonna be a, a big goal for everyone and making sure that your elected officials mimics and mirrors what the community goals are and what the community stands for. You wanna be able to prioritize and have effective communication, meaning you should be able to have an open door policy you should be able to create a safe space for residents to come and voice their opinions, concerns, and give suggestions on what things can happen in their community to be a healthier community for all. And you wanna be able to make smart decisions. Um, an effective community leader incorporates concerns from both sides, making sure that they are listening, again, being respectful, 
And when they are making smart decisions for the community, this makes for a better community. So now we're gonna get into what inspires people? What inspires you? What inspires people to be motivated enough to do positive things and to be more active in your community? So usually what inspires people is purpose. Uh, I know for me, I don't pretty much tag along with anything. It just has to be a solid purpose for me. It has to be something that I believe in. Um, and here are some examples of why people get inspired. History is very important for some people. Um, history can drive people because they want to be remembered long after they're not here anymore. They want to leave some type of heritage. They want to leave some type of mark. They want to leave some type of staple of who they were, what they've done in the world. Um, they want to leave some type of you know, information about themselves and the things that they've done in their life for people to remember and also to be inspired by. People are inspired by helping others. Um, the motivation to serve others is about wealth, success gains, and the youth to the benefit of the community. Helping others is always a plus, always one of the bigger things why people want to be motivated into doing things, aka purpose. Change is another important reason why people are getting inspired, that people want to become um, different in regards to making change, changing their environment, changing the world. Like right now, there's a lot of things going on in the world. So people want to make a change. People want to make positive change in their communities. People also, through change, want to make a powerful impact. People want to have impacts that are long lasting for themselves, their, their community, and what other groups that they are associated with. And people want to feel enlightened, like people want to be educated, people want to gather information, people want to make better decisions for themselves by being enlightened. And when you make better decisions for yourself and when you are enlightened, that means that you are growing, you want to grow, you have a need to grow, you have a need to grow in your community. And if you have that need to grow in your community, then you will watch your community grow as well. So take a few minutes and think about some of the things that inspires you. And I definitely would like to hear some of those reasons that you are inspired and why. So now that we have an idea of what inspires people, we want to also make sure that we have an idea of what and how we can get people to take action. So people like to take action because they feel appreciated. People want to know that their work is being noted. They want to feel like, oh, this person really appreciates that I came out here at seven o'clock in the morning and I'm doing X, Y, and Z. That is key for people is to feel appreciated, which is also a motivating opportunity for people to take action. People want to be able to have an overview of what is going on in the community. So we need to be making sure that we're creating easy, accessible ways for people to support community goals it shouldn't be a difficult task for people to assess things and just assess information about what direction the community is going in and what is happening in their community. Again, communication, uh, learn about different needs and wishes and expectations of the people in your community, which is very valuable and very important. So you know exactly what type of goals that your community should be setting up to make a healthy environment for everyone. Flexibility. It's extremely important. I think right now everyone is truly learning that lesson of being flexible. Remember also that there's more ways to reach common goals than one. So not one way is going to be um, the only way, but several different ways to reach your goals is definitely obtainable. Also, it's important to create opportunities for the members in your community uh, to feel excited about, to feel, you know, very prideful in regards to what they want to do in the community, helping to create shared responsibilities with each other, certain tasks that can be done in the community, very small things like whether it's creating a cleanup day for the community, who wants to be responsible in regards to, you know, getting signatures or passing out flyers in regards to information or making sure the elders in our community are okay, um, 
who wants to serve Thanksgiving baskets during the holidays, just small little things that if you create opportunities for the members in your community to be involved in and to take responsibility, this is a sure way to get people to take action and be hands-on. And last but not least of this, keep things simple. Things doesn't have to be like, there's a bigger, broader picture with things, but if you stick to and focus on one objective at a, at a time with your community members, I guarantee you it won't get so overwhelmed that people don't want to get involved. So just keep it simple and focus on one object at a time to reach your community's goal. I would love to hear also uh, some of additional ways you think that you can help people and motivate people to take action and be more hands-on. Stacy, we've had a few people send in some of their thoughts. Do you want to hear them now or should we save them? Sure, for sure. Yeah, so we talked, a couple people were sending in, um, you know, what inspires them in terms of community action. And one of the big ones is just making a positive difference. And for some folks that's working towards the future and for others, it's thinking about, you know, how things were in the past. And I want to make sure that the experience I've got to have is one that my friends and you know grandkids and future generations will get to enjoy as well. Um, and someone else mentioned making it fun to reach your goals. So if you have you know activities or opportunities that are not just helpful but are fun to do, that can make a big difference in inspiring people and you know being able to overcome differences to just have fun. I love the last part. All of those were great. The last part is definitely true. I find that creating opportunities for people to have fun, recreation, it's a sure way to get people involved and to be active. Everyone who has said something and made a statement is basically saying the same thing. I mean, people want to make sure that we're being close to our friends, close to our relatives in order to make a difference in our community as well. So thank you for those comments and I look forward to hearing some more. We did have a question that someone sent in, which if you're gonna address, um, feel free to save it. But someone was asking about, um, especially if you're working with folks from different backgrounds and perspectives, what are some strategies to help bring everyone together, You know, make a space so that way, even if you have different perspectives or ideas about an issue to Make, make those opportunities so everyone can participate. Thank you for that question. I like meet and greets. <laughs> I think that monthly meet and greets for your community is really, really important. And that's just giving people in the community the opportunities to get together. I know it's rather challenging to do that now. It also can be done virtually where you can have meet and greets for your community to gather together. It doesn't necessarily have to be because there's a main topic that you wanna talk about, but let's meet and greet, let's get to know our neighbors. Let's have these open discussions and conversations about you know, where are you from and what's going on in your life and you know, what different types of background, you know, what school did you go to, et cetera, et cetera. Those meet and greets to me are very, very important because it allows people to give the get the opportunity to talk to one another. Again, when I, when I talked about keeping it simple, keep those things simple. It doesn't have to be so overwhelming, like, oh my God, I, I wanna make sure that we're, we're having diversity. You can have diversity just by keeping things simple. Again, like just doing a simple meet and greet, checking in monthly with your neighbors and seeing what's going on in their life, giving them the opportunity to come to the table and share that information like we're doing right now today. You're, we're sharing information, you're asking questions and you're sharing your information with us. So we're all learning about each other today. So once you have developed like how to inspire, how to get people to take more action, guess what? That's just not a one, one go around thing. You really have to focus on maintaining the relationship that you're building in your community. Again, back to, you know, something as simple as making sure you're having a meet and greet, um, doing follow up So after your meet and greet, you may want to send out, you know, an email blast saying to everyone, hey, thank you for coming out and sharing, you know, with us and sharing your experience, et cetera, et cetera. Sending out e-blasts, text, uh, creating a blog on social media, 
have your have the have members in your community again going back to giving and opening up the opportunities of responsibilities or share responsibilities you know who you know what type of topics do you think would be important to share and and create a blog you may have some really great writers in your community open that dialogue up to see who's going to come out and and interact and participate in that have a monthly newsletter about the status of your community's goals how close you all are reaching it um, have information about achieve, achievements, birthdays, births, college graduates, et cetera. All these things to keep the members in your community informed, keep the members in your community feeling like they are a part of your community is very important. Again, maintaining your relationships in your community. Now, this part as far as the creating a door-to-door -door system, I know that may be a little tricky right now. However, um, it still can be done safely even if it's not you knocking on people's door, but maybe putting newsletters, et cetera, in people's mail slots um, and, and keeping it moving. However, that's also a great way to maintain your relationships in the community, uh, creating community-driven uh, activities, cleanups, garden parties, like I said earlier, we talked about meeting greets, community day, virtual book clubs, virtual social, uh, social hours, you can, you know, you can do, I know one time parents were doing like um, play dates, you, you know, those things are still important in how to maintain relationships in your community. And then also just asking members to do like write-ups about their experience living in the community, which you can use for your blogs and social media, just to capture some of the highlights of what people are thinking about in their community and putting a, a, putting a shine on your community as well. So, I mean, these are just some examples of how to maintain relationships in your community. If you have some suggestions too, we would love to hear more from you about that. So we have a lot of awesome things that we do at Anacostia Watershed Society. We are always interested in hearing back from you all. We are always interested about people connecting with us and and staying abreast to what we're doing and also want to know what is happening in your communities too. However, if you're interested and you want to get involved and learn more about what we do, we have several things that's actually on our plate. You can register for our upcoming Watershed Steward Academy fall sessions that are taking place. And we have our Earth Day event that's coming up in October where we are going to be at 29 sites safely out there cleaning up trash uh, putting in that work that Masia, some of that data that Masia was talking about, this is how he is also able to create some of that data. So if you want to get involved with that, uh, you know, check us out. If you want to learn more about the watershed and, and be a steward, uh, that's, you know, always open and, and we'll be happy to have you and we'll be happy to create more stewards in our community. So you can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you. Great. Well, thank all three of you for that was a great overview from watersheds to trash to some community engagement ideas and keep sending in some of those thoughts and questions, um, as you think of them. When we're moving into our sort of discussion Q&A portion and right on. I wanted to ask um, Stacy a little bit about can you give us one or two specific examples of how your organization has used some of these um, community projects or sort of what outreach you've you've done locally and had good success with? Thank you for that question. Well, one of it would be our Earth Day event. We have over 2,000 people that have joined with us. This is an annual event that we have. We have over 41 site leaders that take the lead in regards to making sure members are being active and getting out there and cleaning up their environment, cleaning up their, their communities. And it has been very, very successful with the amount of trash that we've collected. Again, this has been data that Masi has been able to use and we have been able to pinpoint where the trash is coming from, what type of trash that we're, a lot of the trash that we're accumulating and who's responsible for a lot of the trash that we're seeing out in our communities. And not only just that, but the corporations that are responsible for and also using that information to change behaviors. So getting out there, doing tabling events, having the information 
that we're doing at Anacostia Watershed Society, getting people aware of what we're doing. And even people that are not aware or think that they could care less about what we're doing, we tend to make sure that we are hitting home. These are very simple things. Your environment is just not the home that you, that you step into and that you go to bed. However, it's also when you step outside, you want your communities to be clean. You want your community to be healthy. So between our Earth Day cleanup, between our Watershed Stewards Academy, between our tabling events and all other type of recreational boat tours that we do, we, we definitely make sure that we get this information out there and that we're welcoming all to be involved. And it has been successful because I, you know, every event that we have is either sold out. <laughs> you know, we're meeting all different types of people. People are meeting each other when they come to our events. So it's definitely success that we see when we are doing this. And it's been done for 30 years, 30 plus years. So we must be doing something right. <laughs> yeah, that's great. How do you identify um, potential leaders like for these cleanup events? Is it you have a relationship and people sort of grow up knowing about it? Or is, do you go you know, into community and help identify some folks who might be good to spearhead? Or how do you, how do you find these leaders? So a lot of times when we're doing our tabling events, when we are attending community meetings through different wards within the watershed, people are stepping up to the plate. People are asking, what can I do? How do I get involved? So a lot of times we're meeting people that again may not have had any idea about what we've been doing, you know, what we've been doing, or if they even thought that it was important to them until we have gone into their community, presented what we are doing, and presenting opportunities for them to get involved. So the outreach is very strong. Outreach is extremely important. Going to the schools, going to elementary schools, doing stormwater paintings with mirrors, making sure that people are aware of what a storm drain is and, and where your trash is going when you're throwing it out of your car and you think that it's just going to stay on the street. Like having all this information available for people and getting out there and, and going to the libraries and getting involved in other activities that other organizations as far as partnering with them has been one of the ways that we've been able to identify leaders in the community because they want to step up. And once they hear the information, the people will come and the people have come. Yeah, awesome. I would also say that we would have a lot of cross pollination between our different programs. So people will come to us because they heard about, you know, one of our maybe their kids is in one of our education programs, or maybe they came to a canoe event or something. And once they learn about what we do, and they learn about the watershed, and they learn, you know, essentially that all things are connected, that the trash that's on the street is connected with the river is connected with the water that's in their house and their home and their family, and then they feel inspired to do more. And so sometimes, so another way that we build these leaders is through people who are already in our network who want to do more. Maybe they've gone through the Watershed Stewards Academy, they're learning about all the different pollution issues that are facing our river. And then they say, what can we, what else can I do? And one of the things that we will bring up to them is, well, you know, your community, your neighborhood doesn't have a site leader yet. Would you want to lead an Earth Day site? And so that's another one of the ways that we're able to, to build leaders is through, you know, building relationships with them through our, our whatever program, however they come to us, meeting them where they are, building relationship with them, and then helping them feel empowered to take more action. Yeah, so it's a lot of already having in mind what are some opportunities you can offer while at the same time people stepping up and saying, hey, this is something I've noticed, you know, is this something I can do? That's really great. We had a question that's sort of a bridge between Masai and Stacy's um, presentations, which was about uh, someone asked, what do you see the role of the middleman, um, the big and small stores that sell products that end up at our waterways? So, you know, maybe not Coca-Cola, but the corner store that's selling bottles and cans and whatnot. You know, what is their role in keeping our waterways clean? And do you have any thoughts or ideas about sort of the different roles people can play and maybe where the responsibility lies and helping keep our waterways clean. So let me let me uh, uh, suggest one thing. Uh, when we did uh, advocated or, or for our plastic bag fee legislation in DC, uh, there were 
our supporters and our counter uh, advocacy from plastic industries. But uh, one thing we were surprised was a uh, retail store, or like uh, <clears throat> a grocery retail store. They were supportive. They were supportive because uh, the biggest uh, money they lose was actually a grocery plastic bag because they were giving away plastic bag. So uh, ne next to something, I, I forgot the first uh, most expensive, uh, mo most expensive one was something, but it was second uh, expense, they lose money. So they were supportive. And uh, <clears throat> in this is case, uh, five cent per bags were charged. Uh, charge. <clears throat> I think one cent or uh, one cent uh, will be returned to uh, uh, retail stores. So retail store people can uh, help those things when a photo deposit bill uh, is introduced. Uh, maybe uh, you could say we want to support the photo deposit bill. So we will have a larger support for those kind of registration. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's refreshing to hear. That's nice to hear. I also say that um, for the smaller businesses, really any business, but particularly since the question was about smaller business, we want to be able to hold smaller businesses accountable. And I, I think that it's important that once your community has a goal or several goals that they want to reach, like for instance, over in Ward 5, Calvert um, residents were not happy about how the corner stores, aka liquor stores, were having a lot of people crowded around, just standing around, accumulating a lot of trash. And so one of the goals that the community had was they wanted to clear that space up. They wanted to get more lighting out there. They wanted to make that area much safer while they're walking their children to school. So in their monthly meeting, they would have the police chief there. They would have their ANC there. They would have uh, someone from their council member there and they would voice these opinions and they would put these, the, their concerns and their goals in writing and they just hammered and hammered and hammered away until the change of those small businesses started to say, oh, they were feeling pressure because they didn't want the people in the community to stop patronizing their business. So they knew that they had to straighten up and fly right, if, if that's, you know, politically right to say. However, it's, you know, again, keeping things simple, you know, let these business know that you are holding them accountable. It doesn't have to be in a nasty way because one of the things that people are doing is creating and building relationships with those businesses in the community. So when you are having your monthly meetings and you're inviting the, those business owners to your monthly meetings so they can hear, which a lot of communities have done, it gives the business owner the opportunity to know what a community will stand for and what a community will not stand for. Great. We had a few specific questions about the trash traps, um, not surprisingly. And um, one of them was this sort of a, a combination of two questions. For the trash traps, is this something that AWS did on its own? Did you partner with a university um, or other nonprofits in the area? And to get these trash traps installed, is this something that you as an organization, do you have to, you know, seek permission? Is it something that any small group could do? Sort of what's the what's the step of getting a trash trap like this put in? Basically, we uh, work uh, by our own organization and get volunteers and uh, 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 <clears throat> like a friends group that gives us a uh, support letter, like downstream community called uh, Kenwasa Aquatic Garden, Friends of Kenwasa Aquatic Garden, they will see a significant reduction of trash. So they they, they give us support. And uh, and uh, funding is for, comes from uh, district department of the environment. Uh, yes, we need a permit. Uh, getting a permit is uh, very uh, 
sometimes difficult. Uh, Ami Kobe engineer, landowner, and uh, also uh, <coughs> uh, environmental division, if Maryland uh, MD, if, uh, DC Department of the Environment. So there are several uh, permits we, we need. <coughs> And have you partnered with, like, have grad students come in, or have you partnered with any other organizations to analyze data or take action um, with what you found? Yeah, uh, no uh, direct or uh, strong uh, relationship with universities. Sometimes they send uh, interns, but uh, for data processing, we do it by ourselves. Yeah, um, I think we should also mention that the Nash trap, that was something that Masaya and the folks that he worked with designed. It's, you know, it's not an off the shelf product. It's something that they made that's like actually really unique to what we operate at AWS. There are commercial pro projects that they sell that are trash traps. Largely those are things like trash booms that only catch floatable trash. But the type of trash trap that we have was actually, it was designed at AWS. So. Oh, okay, great. That's great yeah. to know. So we have, we're just about um, at the hour here with uh, one or two more questions um, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, people were very excited. I will just say the comment, people were really excited by that vendor list of the top companies um, that are, whose trash is ending up in our streams. And I think that's a very powerful, it's a very powerful Slide. Um, so certainly, I think people were very excited and a little fired up to see that. Um, we did have some questions about the trash, the kinds of trash that you're finding. Um, and people are curious, especially about the paper items. Does, do, does paper trash include um, like plastic lined items that you actually can't recycle? Was it, you know, just any kind of general paper? Um, what kind of material was that? Usually, that's a paper cup. Paper cup, paper plates, uh, those uh, lined with a uh, thin layer of plastic. So, a uh, thin layer of plastic uh, goes away some somewhere. That's kind of uh, another concern. So, uh, <clears throat> so paper portion will be dis disintegrated, but uh, sometimes I see a uh, thin plastic attached to a disintegrating paper. So basically your paper cup and paper plates. Okay. And you mentioned, so there, uh, you know, float and sink. What about, is there any way that you know of or that you're doing for trash that might get trapped into the sediment, you know, that sinks and sits on the bottom of the river? Is that something that we have a way to deal with? Is that a much bigger project? Um, what about that? Can that kind of trash be sort of parsed out from the floating and not floating? Uh, uh, Non-floating, uh, non-floatable trash, trash movement actually is very difficult. Um, maintenance of the natural trap is uh, tedious and laborious. So uh, when I'm asked, I'm not very much recommending uh, actually to install green type drop. It's not a practical practical way to have so many screen type trash tr trash so that's a way that's one reason we still love uh, trash burn and uh, we I think we need another way to address on non floatable trash uh, pieces so that's why I'm excited with a uh, uh, legislation break free from the plastic pollution act that will reduce our package packaging so that's why uh, we need uh, uh, those kind of legislation. Yeah, I would I would absolutely agree with that. Um, although we operate trash traps and we believe that they're very important tools for advocacy and for data collection, the ultimate goal is not to have a million trash traps on the river. The goal is to reduce the amount of trash that gets to the river in the first place. We want to reduce the amount of trash that we're producing as a society so that we're ending up with less trash that falls on the ground that ends up with less trash that ends up in the river. The goal is, you know, cleaning it out, the trash in the river sediment would eventually, it would probably require dredging a river, which they're considering doing in some places for other reasons. 
but it's not really a financially feasible um, thing to do. We, we don't, we don't want to dig up all of the sediment to get the trash out. We want to prevent trash from getting in the river. And the main way that we can all have an impact on it is to reduce our use of disposable things in our daily lives and to advocate these big companies to change their policies so that they will stop producing so many of these things that end up as trash. So, I mean, I think the number one thing that, that we all can do is to stay active in our communities for cleanups, to get involved with our neighbors, to talk about these issues, to raise the profile of it so that our elected officials will know that we care about it, um, so that business owners will know that we care about it, so that the corporations will know that we care about it. And I think that that's the major way that we're gonna, we're gonna see change. AKA change behavior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's the perfect, the perfect wrap up. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for all, to all three of you for presenting um, great engagement uh, with a great conversations and certainly to all the attendees here can certainly continue the conversation on social media or reach out. Um, Stacy, you mentioned the Academy and the Earth Day event. Are there any other big items you'd like to, to share or let folks know about that are coming up uh, for AWS? Well, thank you. We're constantly in rotation of working with things. Again, check out our website. It has all the information of what we're doing, more information about what Masi is doing, more information about what we're tackling in legislation. So just check our website out and they'll find everything that they need to find there. Great, perfect. Well, thank you all again and um, hope to see folks at our next webinar and we'll post the recording soon. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye.